it's, it's such a wonderful example of how something humble or something simple can mean so much and can be so life-changing, right? Awesome, man. Where, whereabouts are you staying in Cape Town? Uh, I was sitting for a friend in Long Street, actually. Oh, sweet. Okay. It's funny how much of a bubble we were in. Like, when we... Because I was there. I just did my undergrad there. Uh, yeah. I mean, we went to Long Street and stuff, but really didn't didn't explore that much. So, if you had said somewhere outside of, like, the student bubble, I would have been like, nice. <laughs> That's yeah, cool. Really. How, how long have you been in Cape Town now? Uh, 17 years this year, actually, yeah. So it's been a while. How many years? 17. Whoa, okay. Hectic. It's been a long time. Like, uh, I came for undergrad as well, same as you. Oh, I don't know about same as you, but I came for undergrad. Okay. And just kind of stuck around, yeah, never left. Nice. That's amazing. And did, did you do a master's there too? I did undergrad to PhD at UCT. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. I didn't realize you had PhD under your belt. Yeah. Sweet. And postdoc at Stellenbosch. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. That's. <laughs> the man is a well educated Zimbabwean, as, as many are. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, it was a matter of like, um, oh, I can't get a job, I suppose I should study a little bit more then. Dude, I think that happens for so many Zimbabweans. Like, it's, yeah, it's really, it would be interesting to like do a, an audit of like how many Zimbabweans kind of went, went through that. Uh, no, that's so interesting. So what was your, your sort of PhD in? And your postdoc stuff? Uh, loosely speaking, it was molecular biology. Okay. Uh, I was to figure out how plants cope with stress, uh, so either like environmental stress or like infections and uh, attack by animals and other um, organisms as well. Okay. So uh, I was working on two specific proteins that turned out to be critical in in this, the network that controls the sugar levels in the plant. So sugar is everything to a plant. Because if you think about life as a plant, is you can't really move away from stress, right? Like if something's eating you, you must deal with it in whatever way you can. You can't walk away, right? Um, yeah. So they've evolved a bunch of different pathways that can deal with certain kinds of attacks. But all of those things need energy and a lot of sugar. So if your sugar regulation system is messed up then your ability to defend yourself is messed up and your ability to deal with stress is messed up yeah so i found these two proteins that are useful in that uh general network of controlling sugar levels and then what happens if you take away those two proteins the mutants you have after the fact are all compromised it's actually immunocompromised actually yeah. wow so so I've heard something along these lines is like a plant, say a tree or something, like an animal starts chowing it and it releases something like, I guess maybe one of these proteins and the rest of the plant is like becomes bitter or something along those lines for an animal. Is that true? Is that a thing? Yeah. So it, it won't necessarily be a protein. There are proteins involved in that process, but ultimately... Yeah, yeah. Is usually some kind of volatile chemical or something that spreads uh, through the air quite easily. Uh, imagine like you spraying an aerosol, say, hey, we're under attack, kind of vibe, like a, like a can of whatever. So it signals the rest of the plant, but sometimes it also signals other plants in the neighborhood. Yeah. Say there's a heavy or there's a something eating us in the area. So then they increase. Uh, some of the chemical profiles that they have that are 
less palatable for plant for animals so like you find acacias can actually poison herbivores to maintain the populations at a certain level and when they feel like the herbivore burden is low enough then they stop making that chemical and then the population of the grazer can come back up again it's fascinating the interplay that plants and animals yeah. and how quickly would that kind of happen if like something starts eating on a thing how quickly could it spread to like neighboring trees that hey something's up anymore it's been so long since i've had to know this kind of information yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the processes start like immediately it's it's a very it's the same way like uh you get you stub your toe you're gonna deal with it immediately right is is in, in terms of uh an internal system it kicks off reflex action the throbbing starts of inflammation starts the anti-inflammatory starts getting produced there's a lot happening even if you are just like standing there dealing with the pain right yeah so, uh, through a similar process um they're called uh, signal cascades so the physical action of the bite triggers something but also some of the chemicals within the animal, the thing that's doing the biting, uh, can also be detected as this is a specific kind of uh, animal, a specific kind of insect or whatever. And that then leads to different pathways being triggered. So, for example, if there's mechanical damage because of maybe an animal broke a leaf, the things you have to do as a plant are different to if there's an animal eating you, right? Yeah. You know it's mechanical bruising with no biological component. You don't need to go overboard and react with chemical deterrent. Because that uses more energy. Right? Exactly, exactly. Ultimately, it's about conserving energy. Yeah. Wowza. That's nuts. And then I've heard of, uh, like, plants communicating with each other via, like, myocelia networks. I don't know how true yeah. this is. Like, mm -hmm. underground yeah that's really amazing like they share resources and um you find like if some plants are doing better than other plants they were actually like loaning them some nutrients uh and also communicate about infections and disease in general um, a bunch of different reasons for communication yeah yeah but it's very contrary to what people think of plants in competition in isolation yeah yeah right wow so cool Huh. So you're, I mean, you're immersed in this crazy world of science for, like, how long was your postdoc? Postdoc was four years. Okay. And you finished the postdoc and you're like, I'm out, I'm out of academia or what, what was your thinking at the end of that? <laughs> I think it was a matter of, a few different things were happening. I think I was maturing into my identity a little bit more and... I was having doubts and asking a lot of questions about academia in general, but also the nature of the research that I was doing. And even the idea of um, how we value different kinds of education differently, right? So yeah. I was saying this to someone earlier on today, actually. If you were to compare my grandmother and I, for example, right, or any and any elder really on paper i'm more educated but in reality i'm not right mm. um, there's something really messed up with our system if we uh, let me put it, i know what it took me to get my phd intellectually it was a very easy thing to do mentally it was a different story like the mental fortitude to survive the brutality of a phd is a totally different beast so I respect people who have a PhD, not because I think they're clever, but I, I recognize that the resilience that they have to endure that thing over and over and over, over years, it's something else. So I just got disillusioned around the academic space in general. And I was also ready for a new chapter in my life. Yeah, I've never been interested in having a career in one thing. So I knew I would have to like, would have to. I knew at some point I would leave the space, whether it was 2018 or whether it was this year or whenever. It was going to happen, yeah. Oh. Oh, like, how do you 
think of the sort of intelligence of your grandmother like what what I mean obviously her experience was definitely different to yours but kind of what stuff would you want to learn from her or like if you could get the same education as her what aspects of it would you want to tap yeah. into I think it's 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 a there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom in all these uh, older vessels all these elders that in the context of the continent and in some parts of the, uh, the rest of the world as well this is knowledge that we know if someone dies it's gone it's not a matter of there are 30,000 people who can do this thing or know this information. Um, and I, I remember when I was younger, being very against the idea of trying to learn some of these skills. Even like traditional skill sets, like how to make, you know those big mortar and pestles for like grinding maize or like weaving baskets or just like farming and gardening. You know, people who, who farm and you don't see a single calendar in sight. You don't see like any sort of um, documentation of the process, right? They just know their numbers. Yeah, they know yeah, yeah. to plant now. They, they understand the weather patterns, the climate. Yeah. There's a lot of like decades worth of wisdom that you you can't compare to someone doing uh, geology or EGS for three years. And not to say one way is better, but definitely they have different advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. So is the things that you can't necessarily learn in a in a in a room full of experts. Is that thing that they learn and they learn from someone who learned from someone and 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 it's just like millennia of wisdom that's that they, they, there's something about the scientific method, right, that we've convinced ourselves is this superior learning system. And if you say this is anecdotal evidence or anecdotal knowledge from the village, then it doesn't have the same weight. And I want that anecdotal stuff because that's actually like thousands of years of uh, scientific experimentation, right? Yeah. But if you drink guava leaf tea to cure your stomach, uh, Maybe your dosage will be on and maybe hit or miss here and there, but ultimately, you know, you'll be fine if you drink a guava tea throughout the day, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's just like different kinds of wisdoms around the same problem. Yeah, because it's not like they were solving unique problems, their wisdom. They were just living and trying to solve the same questions all human beings have. Um, why am I hungry? Why is this so? How do I plan for the future for this eventuality? Blah, blah, blah. Um, is it time to get new clay pots? Do we know the elder who can make them for us? You know, it's like it's typical questions. They just have different answers to them, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like imagine, imagine learning about uh, a, rain, a rainmaker, right? Or apprenticing with a rainmaker, right? The, the, the way I look at it, it's, it's not a mystical thing that they're doing. I think it's someone who really understands weather patterns. And mm, yeah. They won't make the promise for rain unless they know rain is coming already. <laughs> That's how, how I get it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, give me, give me four days. I'm going to go make a plan for you guys. I'm going to go do my thing and throw the bones and whatever, whatever protocols they need to observe. And then low and bold it rains, right? Of course, it's a stats game. They're playing a numbers game. Uh, and they've got to, they got a way out, right? If it doesn't rain, then it's like, ah, you guys didn't do this thing or you didn't slaughter the goat, whatever, right? <laughs> so yeah. but ultimately, to me, um, because of my own biases and because I've grown up in a scientific context, it's hard for me to understand their approach in a non-scientific way. So I try to find a scientific understanding of how they're doing it. And to me, it's, this is a climatologist. This is a meteorologist who understands weather patterns. Yeah. They yeah. just don't have language to say, oh, the atmospheric, atmospheric pressure is at 16 bars with a low front, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, and they need, they need that, uh, 
kind of like performance or ceremony around it in order for them to like basically survive or get paid uh to do it right like if they were it's like safe. for them to be able to sit and study the weather like someone needs to they're not farming maybe the whole time they're like actually learning about the elements huh yeah. that's that's their work for the community right? yeah 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 handle percentages so there's a lot of like prestige that comes with it a lot of um i suppose goodwill from your community because you are so central to people's livelihood you're central to food essentially right yeah have you read uh art art in the zen of zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance i think it is i know about it but i haven't read it yeah it's one of those ones you see like on a list everywhere right uh at mean. one stage this guy is like going on this road trip with his friends and his son through america and they kind of i don't know they like having they're sitting around the campfire or something and discussing uh native americans kind of belief in ghosts or something and his friends i think are like like laughing at it or like making fun of it and he's like but you you believe in e equals mc squared right uh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like but can you see it uh <laughs> can you see this equation that you like have so much belief in uh that it runs thing the world or whatever it's like yeah. no you can't so it's just an explanation of how things work uh mm -hmm. and it's different to to what you believe in and it doesn't mean that it's not true uh so 100 it's it's one of the the best lessons i've learned actually in the last few years like the idea of certainty is such an illusion um because everything we're, we are living through is so subjective right i'm having my even this conversation we're having we're going to leave you with very different memories of this conversation yeah, yeah. Of it, you know um so the idea that I know all the answers about it, uh, or I know most of the answers to the point where I can ridicule someone else, I've really lost uh, my connection to that idea, yeah. Yeah. Because another way of looking at it, if you're skeptical about something, means maybe you don't have the capacity to access that truth, you know, or that uh, perspective. Mm. Was, there, was there like something that, I mean, you mentioned it a bit before, like you just became sort of less and less confident is the right word in like the sort of way of academia, but was there something that prompted that? Was there like some sort of event or like? It, it, it wasn't one specific thing, really. It was, I think small little moments that stack up eventually into one final burst of uh, action. Yeah. So top or in the beginning it was moving to Stellenbosch. That was a different cultural experience for sure. But also the time that I moved to Stellenbosch, I was much older compared to when I started at UCT undergrad, right? So I was a lot more open to the idea that there are things in the world besides me you know <laughs> when you're younger you're very much um or you can be the universe yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so with time that feeling for me dissolved away and i started to see other people's problems and concerns and struggles as part of my own uh world of struggle and uh, things I should be concerning myself with and when, when you are, when you start seeing people and the entirety of existence as one thing that's made up of smaller pieces you, you kind of shift your perspective quite a bit like um, the, the idea that pl planting a seed in a garden you know it's such a small little magical thing, but the consequences of it are so huge. How many lives are going to feed off that little plant? Like the, mm. the moths and the wasps and 
the little aphids, ladybugs, all the little ecosystems, all the microbacteria. Um, we're talking maybe it's going to be a leaf that someone's going to eat. And, 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 and so it's just like when you realize you're very small and there's a lot uh, you could be enjoying and there's a lot you could be doing for others as well. So yeah. moving to set triggered some of that because coming from UCT, I had a very different experience of being black in South Africa uh, that doesn't work well in the Selenbosch context. Um, so I was very abrasive when I moved to Selenbosch because I was like, how, how is this normal? How are you accepting this? And a lot of the black people in that space did undergrad there. So they grew up in that space from undergrad. So they don't even see or they couldn't see just how messed up things were and how dismissive the sensibilities of the space were around black identity. Um, so that was another thing. And also just realizing I've always enjoyed science for the sake of doing experiments, but I hate the idea of writing up my experiments. I hate the idea of asking for funding. Um, yeah. I'm not a fan of all the other bureaucracy around the scientific experience. I could be, I would be quite happy to just go into the lab, do an experiment, see what happens and move on immediately yeah. without having to report it or, you yeah. know for that kind of research and work in the world right part of research is you have to write things down and yeah, share, yeah. Them, share them and i'm just like i want to see if it goes purple or not it went purple <laughs> <laughs> it's both <laughs> yeah there was a few different things huh. mm. uh, and then so where like straight out of out of your postdoc what did you what did you do? So 20, 2015 postdoc stars, 2015, 16, 17, 18, yeah. Uh, just ooh, June, July 2018, I decided to start Tapi Tapi. Um, and at the time, I'm doing it as a way to save money. Hang on, let me rephrase that. I decided to start Tapi Tapi but keep my job so I could keep working to raise some funds to actually start the business. That's how I was looking at it. Okay. And by the end of 2019, so about a year and a half later, that's when my contract was ending, but I also decided not to renew it. I could renew for one more year, but I was like, actually, no, it's okay. Let me leave now. Uh, so end of December, Generally, I spent some time in a restaurant just learning some of the, you know, the, the ways of running a restaurant space. And February 2020 opened up the cafe. Yeah. So I was like, maybe like a month break before I... Whoa. So you, you didn't, you weren't like running it in parallel with, with working? No, when, when I was still working full time, I was just doing deliveries. So it would be uh, during the week. I would release the menu, people would order, sometimes custom orders, and then on the weekend, I would do like one long trip from Selenbosch to Cape Town, dropping ice cream off along the way. Uh, Sweet. Like visiting uh, my then um, friend and partner in the city. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, I guess that was just like, you had that, was it a year kind of like of experimenting, uh, and trying out recipes and stuff that's cool and then it was a it was a fun time it was a good time to play around with the proof of concept and i was also doing pop-up menu experiences so like little tasting menus events partnering up with other people in the city and like ice cream and poetry ice cream and yoga ice cream and rope performance uh wine okay. pairing and, and, and it was just playing around there yeah. that's epic yeah and and how how did the ice cream thing start like why why ice cream ice cream is uh, it's always been something that i've been uh, i enjoy um 
even as a kid, I never lost my excitement around ice cream as an adult. Yeah. Uh, so I remember, like, you know, going to Avondale Scoop, uh, <laughs> you know, back, back, back in the day. Uh, That's cool. You know, Did you, you get the plain cone dip in the caramel sauce? Yes, on. yes. <laughs> that was, like, was mind blowing, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> That was like the top of the top of the top of experience of ice cream, man. Yeah. But I think that is now like it's it's such a wonderful example of how something humble, something simple can mean so much and can be so life changing, right? Uh, if you think about the culture we have around our, we have now around food and the foodie kind of mindset, is like I needed to be modern gastronomy, slow poached for six years in the sous vide. And, and 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 like all this complexity, right? But like the joy of giving a kid like a plain white comb with a flake in it, it's just like <laughs> so magical. Um, yeah. And, and of course, their palate is in a different place compared to you as an adult now. Yeah. And yeah. How we are eating in general. Now. Even like kids who come to the cafe now have very sophisticated demands and palates. <laughs> like <laughs> give you your ice cream. Like I. Like, are you six or what? Are you meant to be doing this? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I started uh, the ice cream making for myself about, let's say, 20, 2008. Yeah, about 12 years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, it was just like a, a fluke. I was watching Master Chef, and I saw them making ice cream using... Uh, liquid nitrogen and dry ice and at the time I could get that at UCT on upper campus uh, whenever we got deliveries of dry when it, whenever you deliver some kinds of enzymes and other scientific chemicals they normally come with dry ice to keep them at a certain temperature and the excess you can't use it for anything you just let it sublimate it just like turns into gas and that's it you don't have to yeah. throw it away so I then made the connection and say, oh, we always get deliveries. Let me ask the delivery person to always give me some of the dry ice. They can make some ice cream at home. And it was as simple as that. So every time we got a delivery, I'd make some ice cream. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. the, the thing that limits ice cream making at home is you need to buy a machine, right? Yeah. Ice cream. That's uh, the biggest challenge. And when you are undergrad or honors or bursary, 2,000 rand on an ice cream machine is not exactly a good use of your, your money. <laughs> so would you just have like the dry ice in a bowl or something and then you just by hand and it's kind of like yeah. it's just keeping it cold and it's kind of yeah freezing as you... you essentially because the dry ice transitions from solid straight to carbon dioxide, right? To gas. Um, if you dump all that dry ice into any liquid, that liquid is going to freeze but it won't form ice because it freezes so quickly. There's no time for the ice crystals to form. So you get a smooth texture. So you can go from like liquid ice cream that's been chilled to actual ice cream in about 30 seconds, depending on the volume, of course. Yeah, but it's very, very quick. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Huh. And is that still the method you're using? Or are you? I still train it by hand. I still train it by hand. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a nice way of controlling the texture because if you imagine ice cream as a whipped cream or egg whites, right? The faster you beat it or the faster you churn it, the fluffier you can make it and the more air you can incorporate into the product and the lighter it can become. So in the industry, that's called overrun. And overrun is... if. The, the more extreme version of overrun is a soft serve ice cream. It's got so much air in it. If you let it melt, you know you're going to get like this much left from like the cone that big, right? That kind of discrepancy. Um, and if you're trying to teach people about new flavors, there are two factors that I consider important. Number one is the amount of fat in the ice cream. So the more fat you have, the more richness you have, but the less of anything you're tasting. All you're tasting is fat and it feels fantastic but yeah. if you think about dark chocolate versus a milk chocolate similar experience mm. and then the second thing to consider is 
how fluffy is the ice cream. So if you think about candy floss, it hits your tongue, you get a hit of flavor, then it's gone. Same with the sugar, with the soft serve cone. You get a hit of sugar and fat and whatever is in there, then it's gone. But if you have a dense ice cream, it keeps melting and melting and melting on your tongue. So for the same size teaspoon, you have more weight within the mm. teaspoon, flavor within the teaspoon. Yeah. And if you use a machine, it's very hard to limit the amount of air incorporating into it. Um, unless you get a very specific kind of custom machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Plus also the, the machines are really expensive. So as a startup business, you're talking about like a hundred thousand rand to get a very basic commercial churner. Wow, yeah. Sure. And that's like five thousand pounds. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, not a small amount. <laughs> And then with the business, did you, like at what stage uh, did you manage to break even? Like, uh, so the, 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 the biggest expenses were the freezers, really. So the freezer to store the ice cream and the freezer to serve the ice cream in. And that was like maybe... 35,000 rand total. Then the rest is like containers and like pots and stuff. So maybe uh, overall starting costs, I would say at the most, maybe like 60K. Okay. So it didn't take that long to actually cover that number, even considering COVID and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, wa it was. Let, let me put it this way. I think I was only... I had I, I'd, I'd approached this in a very specific way. I wasn't trying to make that money back. I was just considering my own investment in myself and in the project, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew from the first sale that I made, that's the first money that I'm making. I'm not trying to catch up with the deficit. This was like someone donated money to me. That's how I was looking at it. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've never really thought about that number really to say when did I get to the mark. Yeah, yeah. A fact that I consider it important. Yeah. I mean, it's like an MBA in South Africa is probably like a hundred thousand rand, maybe. That's my guess. Yeah, so yeah, it's not cheap. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like it's like an MBA because you just okay, you're gonna learn about business by just doing it yeah. kind of thing. Okay. Um, yeah, there you go. of course. You take a bit longer to learn, and there are other lessons you can avoid practically by learning them about them theoretically, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly that thing of like, I think you can get an MBA if you submit your business idea, right? You have to do some, some research work and some learning work, but I think they take in businesses as part of the MBA experience. Yeah, I think. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I think it's like it's like a, uh, the thi ah this is so funny. Uh, I remember having lunch um, with my dad and a friend of his, um, and his friend his friend wanted to do a PhD in music, right? And my dad is. He's not understanding what 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 are the motivations. Why you, why would you do that, right? Because this friend happens to be Oliver <laughs> <laughs> and, and my dad is like, you know, other kids are going to university to study you, right? Like, <laughs> why, why do you still feel this need for like validation and like the piece of paper to say you're worthy when you are now subject material for other people who are learning music? Um, so the, I suppose like having a business in a way is it negates the need to f do a full on MBA experience. I'm sure part of it is important and useful. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. They, they yeah. Are some percentage all the way there. Yeah. 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 It's a funny thing that with getting that piece of paper is so wired into how we think, right? Like, yeah, hundred percent.
I mean, I, I did a master's here in the UK and I kind of went in with like, I was like, okay, I'm going to get a 70, uh, which is like, a, I guess a first class, I think, uh, 70 or 80, whatever it was. I was like, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to get. But also I don't want to work too hard because I was like running, I was like, in my undergrad, I just worked so hard uh, and like hardly, I mean, I did get involved in like extramural stuff, but I was like, man, I came out of undergrad and I didn't, I knew like maybe one lecturer that I could like write to for a reference. Uh, yeah. And I was like, no, my masters, I'm going to know all the lecturers, like all the people. So I was like, yeah, I was working as hard as I could, but I was like working on the bow tie business at the same time and like getting involved in other stuff and so my grades did suffer and i think i ended up with like one percent or half a percent off this distinction and i felt terrible but i had got so i got so much more than like half or all of my class like i really got so much out of the experience but i still like had this like bitter end when like that was the last thing was to get my results it's like why why we just need that external validation or that mm. little little number on a piece of paper to make you feel better about yourself it's yeah it's especially because that number means very little very quickly right so like now you've got your masters the 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 playing field you uh, the, the 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 pool you're now swimming in is other people with masters right yeah. Uh, same way with I have a PhD. It says something about how you maybe solve problems, how you think critically, blah, blah, blah. But so it says the same thing about anyone else with a master's or with a PhD. So when like employees are looking for people, yeah, you got your master's, great. Let's move on. We don't need to know you at 69.7% or like 71.3%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Um, like it was way more relevant trying to get into university to say I have 14 points or 15 points for my O levels, A levels, whatever. Yeah. Because that was that world, right? But it's kind of, I don't know, it's almost refreshing to know that like Tuku is thinking of that also. <laughs> it's like even the best of us, we still struggle with that. Like imposter syndrome and like, am I good enough? Have I done enough? Yeah. This? yeah. These are like eternal questions and struggles. Yeah. Mm. So uh, have you, have you struggled with that much? Like with, uh, what do you mean exactly? Give me a yeah, specific. Like, yeah, the imposter syndrome, like, I don't know, maybe starting your own business. Have there been like moments where you're like, what am I doing? <laughs> It's, it's not, not so much imposter syndrome. It's more like quest questioning, like, like what you said, like, do you want to work too hard, right? I, I, I often question decisions that involve me working too hard because I'm here to live, man. I'm here to live. I'm not looking to be totally consumed by one thing and have it, like, drain all my resources day in day out i'm just showing up to move money around to move energy around but i am depleted all the time hmm. so struggle with moments that require a bit more seriousness because that also means a, a lot less uh a lot less of tapio enjoying yourself and a lot more of a business person doing something strategic or business minded yeah and i hate the operating that kind of space. I know some people thrive and live under those kind of conditions and enjoy that hustle of the business. I can't stand it. I love the creative moments in the business. I love the silliness, talking to people, uh, painting at work while I'm waiting for customers. They're like the slow time, the idea of running like a full kitchen, like service, like, you know, like that sounds horrible, 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 horrible. So I, I, I tend to just do things and see what happens. Um, for me, the biggest thing is I tried something, it worked or it didn't work. 
and I can move on. I don't, I try and avoid dwelling too much on was it a success or a failure? Uh, mm. As opposed to did something and I enjoyed it, you know. Yeah. So with that kind of mindset, imposter syndrome isn't too huge a big deal. Um, but there are moments where, but it's it's a difficult thing to describe exactly. But so some of the difficulty with uh, the ice cream shop is sometimes people will say something dismissive about people's cultures or something offensive even, you know. Like, um, let's say last year I made Mopani worm biscuits as a flavor of ice cream. It was delicious, right? But what I did was I would call it the mystery flavor. And if you want to know what flavor it was, you had to taste it first, right? Because I know people have their hang-ups and their biases. Yeah, yeah. All right. And so you get people taste. Oh, they're like, oh, it's amazing. What is this? Then you tell them. And some people recoil and be like, oh, no, I can't believe you did this to me. Um, even if they loved it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they want to take it back, but they can't take it back anymore. And in moments like that where you can see someone is genuinely angry or offended or disgusted or disappointed about a flavor you've made. Meanwhile, there are like millions of people who eat that thing, you know? It's, yeah. it's difficult to keep doing the work in the face of that kind of uh, cruelty. Yeah. yeah. So, imposter syndrome, but it's hard to stay strong and convicted or maintain conviction around your identity when your identity is so front of the house all the time and people casually say exactly how they feel without really yeah. thinking about what they're saying. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, man. Yeah, because I definitely, I think I had that when we were kind of starting mm. up was like, I before we started, I didn't use social media that much. Mm. Uh, and then and I was I was like man I'm gonna put out this persona uh, online of because like as a brand like as a brand you kind of want to have maybe some consistency like so people know in some ways what they're engaging with like because if a brand is like jumping around like trying to talk to different people or talk in different ways it's just like what is this like they're just all over uh and, and i guess you i almost felt that a bit with like personally i kind of like okay i have to be consistent in how i talk but that's not who i am at all uh and i was like oh man i'm boxing myself to be so it's almost like i was like creating a fake persona and i think i've maybe moved away from that more and like just embraced being putting myself out there uh yeah. and like yeah it's been like this is this is me uh if you don't like part of what i i do like that's that's it right but it's yeah that's such an important lesson for someone to come to uh i farm I'm, I'm far more interested in, in the the truth of the person versus what they think I want to hear, right? Because I already know what I want to hear. That's boring, right? If you can tell me something that only you know, someone like you knows, that's that's like far more exciting. And you find people often fall into this trap of, oh, this brand does really well. And they always do their work like this. Yeah. Uh, and let me try and also work like that. And I was also in a similar position in the very very beginning plating things a certain way trying to you know like that thing of you have the heading then like a strong a, a continuous line to break the heading and the text and then yeah. you arrange a certain way put the little dots between the shona and the english name of a dish like trying to do this highly curated thing that was done like in a boardroom you know or the illusion of a boardroom and always saying we are tapi tapi as if there's like 30 people in the company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then slowly you tire, you tire of it. Because yeah, it's not yeah. a to remember who you are in that context, right? Yeah. Versus 
just behaving as you normally would because that's your natural disposition. Um, so eventually I also just like, I was like, no, this is enough. I'm going to speak exactly what I need to speak. Um, if you don't like it, that's okay. If you love it, if you like it, also great. There's no need to... Like you, you find often... Um, oh, I just remember something. I really hate, and I don't use hate often, but I hate the fact that we've gamified conversations, right, and engagement. Like if someone DMs you on Insta or on Facebook or Twitter or even WhatsApp or like email, right? They want a response. They want it. Even Facebook tells you, respond the next 30 minutes, you get a new badge. You know, oh like, God, yeah. Like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> all these ridiculous things that people feel are uh, an essential part of uh, the experience of being a consumer, right? Yeah. Uh. I'm so uninterested in any of that, right? Like, you'll find I'll respond to this morning. I responded to Facebook messages from February. Because <laughs> <laughs> I had the capacity for it. I was in the mood for it. I was like, okay, let me reach out. Let me see what people are saying. Right. But I'll, I'll make a post and I'll say what I want to say. Then I'll move on. Right? Yeah. And while someone says something and I happen to catch it in that moment, I've got time, I'll respond to it. But ultimately, yeah. you only engage with people because who's got the time? Right, like yeah, it's hectic resource drain to be constantly on responding responsibly. When are you actually doing the thing that people want to see from you? Exactly. You take that to like the nth degree, like way out. It's like no, it's just not possible. When you when you're in like the millions of followers or something, it's just there's no way that you're gonna be able to do that. And I guess that's when you bring on more people to like help you out but i don't like that expectation like yeah it's the same idea of like um like rating people right like my uber guy took 20 minutes longer than i anticipated one star right and there, there's no context to that one star all right the algorithm reads it as one star other users read it as one star and ultimately you've changed someone's earning capacity that any capacity from a really terrible job as well, right? Like, yeah. imagine winter in the rain on a scooter to get someone a muffin, bro. What are we doing? You know? And then you still go and say, yeah, no, one star. Despite all the magic that this person had to perform to get you a muffin. Yeah, like, how incredible is it? Like, <laughs> I mean, just take that for granted, right? It's like this incredible yeah. experience. Like, yeah. I got this bizarre like tiramisu or whatever yeah. <laughs> it's italian recipe and but no i didn't get you like five minutes sooner so <laughs> horrible horrible never again mm, you know yeah. so, so, so at, at one point did you then switch uh how many months or years into the social thing did you realize actually this is draining it's not really fulfilling me in the way i thought it would how, when did you make that switch? I don't know if I fully have made the switch. Like, <laughs> like I feel like I go in cycles and like burn out and then like, this is not sustainable. Like go stop completely and maybe go again. Because <laughs> yeah. part no, of me is also, the, I mean, there's the like- question of yourself in that context. Sorry, come again? I, I meant when did you, because you said you made the connection between there's an, there's, Kim the actor and then there's Kim the more genuine social media presence, right? At, 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 at what point or I suppose at what ratio of the professional actor and the human being are you playing at the moment? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's I think it's like more and more so my this was my worry when i started out was like is there going to reach a stage where i don't know the difference right where i like become this thing that like because <laughs> like for example the bow ties like i don't wear bow ties all the time uh yeah. like i'll wear them to events like if i go to like 
a dress up event or uh like maybe the theater or something like that. it's like quite formal so i'm like not wearing it all the time but the online like what people maybe see is they think i maybe wear a bow tie 100 like, of the time like you've got bow tie pajamas exactly <laughs> and so it's like oh like should i be wearing that all the time or and so you start like going yeah and and they also like you become vanilla right you like don't say sort of extreme things because you're like okay this has to fit into this uh and yeah so i don't know where i'm at i don't know where i'm at with it like i think more and more i'm just like posting what makes me happy uh so but that's that's an also another thing a side effect of social media is like you can't post far out stuff because it gets you into like a conflict uh and that conflict is just draining for me uh and so i end up like i just post stuff that's like pretty positive and like that's kind of who i am to 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 a large part like i'm like pretty upbeat positive person but there's definitely like stuff that's just kind of like outrageous or like i mean just looking at the zim government for example it's like oh my gosh and now i could easily like spiral down this thing of like just being angry also uh but then it's so draining but that's kind of the design of social media is like once you get into conflict like it spirals uh and so I've been like pushed into this super positive thing because I just, but in real life, I would, I would probably want to have those. I would want to talk about that stuff, right? Like I talk about that stuff with friends and stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing and I'm still not sure about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so strange. And it's also, it, yeah, I guess it's just, it's like a powerful tool. It's like a really powerful tool, right? And it's like, is useful because you can like connect with those people who are interested in your super niche thing. Uh, uh, yeah, so. That's where the danger is, right? That's, that's how you like start having that conversation of justifying stunt positions with yourself. It's like, um, same with money, right? But yeah, I, I can do so much with the money. I can do this. I can do that. Then you, you start suddenly. Ah, let's use this fabric for this particular tie. Let's just thin this out a little bit. Let's let's just let's just let's just and yeah. of those kind of bargains that you have to make, that you can make with yourself. If if you're not if you're not centered by your own internal point, right? Mm. If, who you are based on the needs of the machine or the entity right so for for me for example i i know exactly why and i knew exactly why i wanted tapi tapi to open up as a physical location and part of it is i knew i was making a terrible business choice to open in that neighborhood because i could open in seapoint or camps bay and literally make like maybe 40 50k a day right just like print money because i'm like um tapi tapi is like niche tourist products right if there's one thing tourists want is an african experience when they come here yeah um so i know i'm in the wrong financial location but despite all the hardship and the difficulties of winters and hogs and all these other things, I've also stayed true to why I opened up this place and why I opened up in hogs and what it means. Um, and because I knew I was never, I was trying to get into this for the money. Um, I was really focused on why I was doing it. So it's a lot more difficult to shift me from my center. And that also translates into the social media aspect of things. It's a lot less. You you've seen my posts, right? Like, 
I'm very clear about what I'm saying and this is why I'm saying it. And yeah, some people don't like it. It is what it is. Some people will disagree. It is what it is. Yeah. Um, but I'm not trying to make you feel better about yourself. I'm trying to share the truth. Yeah. Uh, What's vanilla, truth. man? <laughs> What's vanilla? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. so you're gonna get everything right if you like my happy stuff you're gonna enjoy my aggressive stuff as well you you, you can't just enjoy me as a happy product you have to accept that what we're doing is political work is difficult work and yeah. there's there will be some grumpy days yeah yeah so wh- why did you open up an obs well, it's a balance of uh different kinds of people uh like different kinds of wallet capacity, different kinds of racial uh, profiles, um, food traffic, driving traffic. It's accessible because of uh, all different kinds of public transport can make it to OBS. And I knew because of the spatial apartheid in Cape Town, it's, we've got a legacy of a lot of the really nice things in the city are uh, in nice neighborhoods where primarily it's not black people who live there, right? And I wanted to be a bit more accessible to black people. As much as a lot of my, my market base is still white people, I know I'm a lot more visible, a lot more accessible to a lot more black people um, because it's... it's I remember going to the waterfront once, right? And for the listeners, uh, the waterfront is like a shopping mall along the harbor in Cape Town, all right? And it's one of the, this really big places, like very grandiose idea of wealth and shopping experience and uh, being seen in public doing waterfront things, right? And that's sort of air to it. And I remember, a taxi guy dropping me off, but he had to come in with me to get money for the ATM. And he grew up in Cape Town. And he was like 26 at this point in time. And that day was his first time inside the shopping area of the waterfront, right? He's always dropped off people there, the car parks and all that. He's never been inside, inside. And he had such an amazing experience of this moment. He literally said to me, I'm going to bring my family here for Christmas just to see this place, you know? And that, that was like such a, a violent, like awakening to the, the city we live in, you know, like someone's idea of a Christmas celebration is to come and see the waterfront. Right. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? This is just like shops, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it says so much about this country. It says so much about Cape Town. Um, yeah, it's like something you just take for granted. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So I knew uh, I do want to exist in a place where a black person get to me once a year, and they they have made effort to come to me. Yeah, that's 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 not. That's yeah, not. yeah, and also yeah, it's not even it's not even for your customers. It's like I'm just imagining like. A little kid who's like living in OBS and walking past your shop every day and like yeah. seeing, oh, this dude who's like running an ice cream shop, like that's cool. Like I could do that, but that that visibility also. Visibility and res- representation for sure. And even like the idea that they can come in and look at the menu and laugh because the experience of children's innocence and making fun of the ridiculousness of the menu, right? Yeah. The, they're laughing not because they think you are doing something ridiculous. You should be ashamed of. They're laughing as, I can't believe this man is doing this. I had a mercy last night. Now there's a mercy ice cream. What are you talking about, right? And they're laughing. It's unbelievable. But it's amazing and awesome in the true sense of that word. Like awesome, like awe-inspiring to that kid. Like they can't imagine this, right? Whereas, like a more jaded adult or gro- more grown-up person will, will laugh because this is so stupid. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I knew opening up in OBS would also open it up to that kind of possibility for a kid who grew up knowing, yeah, 
these should be the flavors of ice cream I eat because I live here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almond and pistachio and guava or whatever else, right? Yeah. Like, throughout seeing you in menus, then it's not, it shouldn't be a big deal to say we're going to go have African ice cream now. It should be the normal boring experience of this city. Yeah. Let me go have Italian, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. So interesting. Wow. And what about like the arts, the art side of things? When when did you get into art? So the art is actually the first thing. That's 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 like from when I was like four or something. Um, I've always enjoyed creating things in general. So whether drawings or crafty things like making bracelets and chains, like I just naturally would pick up things and start messing around to see what I can make. And I was never trying to make spectacular things. I was just making things because I like to make things, you know. And so I used, excuse me, I used to do a lot of like portraits, but like from my head without a reference. And I would just try to draw random faces. Uh, and then in high school, I made, a, I made a friend who had amazing handwriting, a really, really amazing handwriting. And I remember looking at my handwriting, I was like, oh yeah, my handwriting is trash, eh? Like, <laughs> I need to do something about this. And I, I copied his handwriting. <laughs> and I got some good at it. People used to, would be able to tell who's, who's, who's. <laughs> and then we got into calligraphy and would start doing like, uh, typography and like lettering and just like playing around with uh, making we did like a lot of clothing labels like this is my new label it's all about this 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 the logo and it's called blah 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 and we'd have these little diaries full of sketches and full of drawings wow you know and started coming up the own alphabets this symbol stands for A and it stands for B and you're like making all these little alphabets that you using to encode your own secret language and i just 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 grew grew more and more in love with um, handwriting and mm -hmm. i didn't would have like 300 pens you know like different colors different nib styles fountain pens marker pens big pens fine point thick nib clutch pencils like would like make like cheats cheat sheets for exams like with like a point one millimeter pen like <laughs> like like was like a skill you know <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, you would go to a point where we're like machines like you could write as if it was tight and it was um something that i really enjoyed and i've never been the kind of person who holds on to their creation so i make stuff and i give it away or i throw it away but I wish I'd kept some of that stuff because it was like beautiful, beautiful stuff. And so Varsity came along, I kind of let go of the art and focused more on the studies and a bit of the cooking. So I was, actually throughout Varsity, I, I used to do a lot of drawing and my handwriting, I maintained my practice as well. Um, but in the post-grad years, I started doing less and less of that until mm, maybe like three years ago again, I picked up, I never stopped writing, but I picked up my writing practice a lot more again. Like I'm writing to learn how to write as opposed to I'm writing because I'm taking notes, you know. And uh, I've always been into abstract art and then I started seeing a lot more people doing what I used to do as a kid. Yeah. But and I'm like, oh, yeah, I, remember, I used to do this a lot. Why did I stop? And then I started going back and revisiting that. And lockdown really helped with that. Uh, and that's when Kashikiro started. So, and Kashikiro is like my kind of calligraphy that is very spontaneous. And I use it to tell African stories, like creation stories, mythology stories, or like philosophy. Um, so the bigger picture says something about a particular tribe's belief system or whatever, but the individual shapes and letters within the script don't have a literal meaning. And it's, it's a lot more freeing. It's like spontaneous. 
and I call it Kashikiro because Kashikiro is like a small little spirit medium. So it feels like something I'm receiving from, some, from somewhere else and I'm passing it on to you and then I move on. I'm not the one creating it, but I'm facilitating some other things expression through my hands so that you can see it and it moves forward. Um, so that's kind of like how it's now developed now. And it's fun because it's, it's, it's allowed me to lean into the work that I'm doing with Tappy Tappy in a different way. Um, we don't grow up hearing about creation stories from around the continent, like mythology from around the continent and even philosophy and politics from around the continent. And if you can condense that uh, into a, like a visual medium, oh, that's nice looking, that's nice. What's that about, right? Then you tell them the story, then people can connect with it. In the same way, the ice cream is a scam that gets you to pause for a little bit, like, oh, what's going on here, ice cream. And once I have your attention, I can hit you with something else. So you yeah. look at the image, and once I have your attention, read the blurb, uh, the blurb, the caption. Oh, there's more to this. There's actually like hectic yeah. stuff about this story. Um, so again, it's just important to share these stories. Whether or not I believe in them is immaterial. Someone does, and that someone's voice needs to be heard. Yeah. That's amazing. That's so good. Huh? <laughs> like uh, just going back to your seeing discovering someone's handwriting i remember like looking at a friend's handwriting and seeing like i would write g's like a g like that and she would write g's and do that at, at the bottom of her she and it just like blew my mind i was like oh I can write G's differently. And then I would like start writing the G's. <laughs> but it's crazy how you just get out of that. Sorry? You now had a font set you can play with. Exactly, yeah. And you just get out of that. You're just in that groove. It's so so much like, it's kind of like a self-awareness, right? Because you're, that's how I write. And it's like, whoa, there's like a way to write completely differently. <laughs> And it's fascinating because we can all agree that the, the shape I'm seeing is an A. Because there are some basic fundamentals to the shape, but these A's have never been so different, right? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's just like amazing that we can still communicate these thoughts and ideas, but using such a different range of possibilities for the same symbol, yeah yeah mm. and uh i know i've asked you this before i've kind of forgotten what uh your def do you have a definition of creativity <sighs> this 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 is a, this is a nice question it's an important question because to me creativity is to be a human being right like there's no there isn't that moment in your day when you're not being creative um because if you go through a day and you haven't been creative it means you're stuck in a groundhog day you, it means you're living the same day over and over right yeah it's living that day no one has the same experience every single day so you're pulling on previous experience but you're still adapting to new moments perpetually until you die there's no day you're going to repeat perfectly and crack it just right so for me creativity is is how we live it's our existence right now it's our perpetual state of being as a creature um the grade and the level of creativity varies right even something as simple as driving a car um Sometimes like, oh, let me take this route. That's a creative choice. Why am I taking this route? Ah, maybe I'll see something different. Maybe I'll see someone, maybe it solves this problem. I'm trying to avoid the traffic cops there. How do I deal with this problem? Navigate all the different routes. But now there's a track strike today or you know, they're closing for the two ocean cycle. So I need to, you know, something as simple as navigating your routes to work. That's a hell, hell of a creative process. And if you are approaching with that same level of awareness as you would when you want to write or when you want to cook. It could be fun. It could be a really fun, creative experience. Right? One thing that I really like doing is I like beating Google Maps, right? 
uh, or guesstimating what Google Maps is going to tell me the distance is. So I'm like, last time I drove here, it's 40 minutes at this speed, but I'm going to a different direction, a different place. And there's also, I feel like two hours of sitting in traffic. So I think it's 45 Ks or whatever. I love playing that kind of game for no reason, right? <laughs> I can go into Google Maps and get the answer immediately. I don't need to. Do yeah, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I just love it. Like, even like the creativity of seeing different kinds of seeds germinate. The same seeds, the same plant seeds, but trying to anticipate which one is going to grow faster because I'm putting it on top versus in the soil. But I don't yeah. want to look at the side. This was a bigger seed side. So I guess this one's going to be faster. Ah, in that case, if all these seeds look like they would be faster, can I plant them on the outside so I have a high garden wall and then a small little something in the inside of the pot? Can you can I mess around like that? You know, so like creativity is like demanding fun from the day for me. That's creative. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's it's almost like it's everyone, like by your definition, everyone is creative because each moment you're doing something unique and yeah, the yeah. difference is how aware you are of that and the more you become aware of that the more you might want to experiment with it right because you're like i did this the same yesterday i'm doing it the same again today why don't i just try this one little thing different or and yeah wow yeah because the day the danger of not seeing yourself as a creative person then you end up doing the same mundane things over and over and blame it on your lack of creativity, right? And it's very, it's very easy to live an unfulfilled life because you believe the idea that only artists are creative, only musicians are creative. And part of it is we tell each other the story that only experts can do expert things, right? But sure, there are some people in the village who are known to be great musicians, right? Or great singers. But we, it doesn't stop everyone in the village from singing when they're working, no matter how terrible a singer they are, right? Uh, you know, like with the old school mortar and pesto, when you're doing the thing, people are singing songs, you got a rhythm going, not because we're trying to do a performance here, because it's a good time, you know? Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing I hate is people try to tell me to stop singing because I don't sound good. Uh, you can go to hell with that. I'm not singing to sound good. I'm singing because I can. And it's yeah. liberating, exciting, and it's free. And it's expression. And everybody has that in them, no matter what. Even if you're making art, you're doing ceramic work, uh, you're sewing buttons. You can make it fun and play for yourself. It, it doesn't have to be. It's not pretty looking. Therefore, I can't sell it. Therefore, I can't be a professional. Therefore, I can't be paid to do this. No, you can be, be creative purely for the joy of it. Yeah. Yeah, those creative arts, stuff that gets elevated by the rest of society, right? Like that is what is viewed as creative. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case. No, and in fact, a lot of those places are very stifling, right? Like, of creativity. Because if we take food, for example, part, part of the... One of the fun moments in my space is when trained chefs come in to taste the ice cream, right? And you, some of them are really excited and they're open and they go for it. And some of them are like, but it's not like French custard, eh? Or, or it's not like, you know, uh, why don't you do a little bit of this to make it a bit more like this? And I'm like, you're missing the point, right? Because a lot of these professional creativity spaces, even with music, you can only sing la, 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 la. You can only dance like this. What are your ballet forms? What's the, if you're a modern dancer, only dance like this. You know, like you spend so many years being broken of all creativity. Yeah. Yeah. to get the fundamentals and the foundation at some point you then realize i wasted so much time learning this and now i'm trying to do my own thing you know when you're trying to like 
you go like to, I think, the, is it the Mickey? Uh, there's a school of painting. I think it was the Michaelis Minton School of Painting or something like that. Or, or whatever, right? Every single person who comes out of the institution, you can tell they went to that, into that institution because they look the same. They've been trained in the same way of painting, right? Then you have to try and develop your own style after all that. And there's a benefit to, have the, to having these institutions, but there's also a cost. The cost is we're making cookie cutters who once in a while have their own flair, right? One of you people will come out of that and they just shine and they can leave from the, the dogma they learned and do something amazing and independent. But ultimately, we're making robots, even in creative spaces. Yeah. Same in spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that's a crazy thing. It's like, huh. Yeah. It's really sad. So I'm, I'm grateful I'm not trained in any of the creative things that I do because I don't really know the rules and I, so I don't really follow the rules. I just do whatever and be happy, be sad. It is what it is. Yeah. Like I, it was funny. I, I went to like a London design week mm. and they had just like all these like sort of different spaces like there were like museums and shops that were like design agencies or they had furniture or whatever and so I was studying like physical product design at the time uh which I guess is different from like industrial design in some ways but like I went into this one gallery and the guy there was this older guy who collected all these pieces uh and I was like, oh, this is really cool. He's like, that's a, whatchamacallit, by so-and-so. And I was like, oh, nice. Uh, never heard of that person before. And then he's like, that's a, whatever. And I was, just, I was just like, this piece looks nice. It's so great. But he was, and I had told him, I think, that I'm, I'm like studying product design. And he was just shocked at my ignorance of like, <laughs> like I didn't know who the greats were. <laughs> but in my mind, I was like, if I'm going to design something, like, I probably design it from like maybe I won't copy those people I, like maybe come up with something original uh, and yeah it's... well as, as original as you can be right considering that every single day you're bombarded by information exactly yeah like whatever I make is going to come from everything that I've seen right and so uh, yeah that's the other thing right like we're we are fed as well like um, this distinction between an artisan and an artist, right? Like the artisan bulk produces, it's just a technical machine that like, they've not sold their work, um, which is absolutely nonsense, right? It's, it's a different expression system. It's this elitism we have around like rarity of things make them better and more impressive. Um, it took this artist four years to make this painting I can do a painting in three hours and then still be happy with it and someone will buy it and be happy with it. You yeah. know? It's not any better or worse. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's just like, so what, I don't know the grades. Am I happy doing what I'm doing? Um, are you happy looking at what I've made? You know? Yeah. It's, it's good to know uh, other people's journeys, but not to worship those journeys. Don't put people on pedestals, you know? These are just other human beings who had the same horrible existence we're having. <laughs> get on some things, fail to some things. Uh, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And with your, like, when you're coming up with ideas, uh, oh, you went sideways on me. <laughs> oh, it sideways? It's turned off. How's your battery? The battery died on the other phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and unfortunately i can't um, arrange the charger is it okay if we use this one yeah no that's cool man cool nice is everything uh, in frame yeah perfect cool so i was wondering with your like when you're creating stuff or just coming up with ideas it's like oh i should do this i should do this how how do you like fit it in everything that you want to do because i'm guessing you just got ideas yeah. 
coming up the whole yeah. time, right? How are you uh, finding balance? I think you mentioned it a bit before, like when you're not enjoying stuff and like that's that's the the challenge of seeing the world as such a creativity outlet or input even, right? You're always finding new ways of enjoying the world and creating things. And sometimes it's quick things. You can quickly execute it, try it out and see what happens and enjoy them, move on. But sometimes it's something you want to do, but it demands so much of you that you can't really justify it started. Um, so I tend to do exactly what I'm thinking about in that moment and try it out. Uh, which means I tend to have a lot of open projects. And some of them are like years open and some of them are like weeks and days, right? Um, and I'm okay with it because ultimately it's about doing things that I'm enjoying as opposed to I'm trying to create a body of work, right? Um, so right now I've got three projects that are on pause because I don't have the time and I want to do them while I'm enjoying them. So I know they're big projects and I know I'm going to get back to them. And what's nice about getting back to them later, my skill and technique is different. So you can see a transition. And I love having work that shows growth and changes and uh, yeah, yeah. approaches and reimaginations. Yeah. yeah. So I really like the idea of leaving things incomplete sometimes. But oh, that's great. That's a great mindset to have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but sometimes it means then I never come back to it ever again. Or yeah. I'll revisit it. You know, like, um, it's a bit of my other phone is dead. My notes app is full of so many thoughts. And what's nice about that is sometimes I just open the phone and I scroll and I scroll. I was like, ah, that idea, I never did that. But now you've had something new happen to your mind or you're now looking at the same old note in a different light. You're like, ah, I'm ready for it right now. Let me do it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this beauty of like sometimes pausing a project because you need more information that you don't know yet if it's coming. And when it shows up, that project is even better than you could imagine. It's even more enjoyable, more exciting, whatever the case may be. Yeah. So currently, focus on the business. So most of my decisions are around is this good for the business or not in terms of a creative project. Can I do this creative project and leverage it for the business? Yes, let's go for it. The ones that are more like just for the funds of it, currently taking a back burner yeah yeah mm -hmm. and do you find like you have like starting multiple things can be stressful like you at all or you're just at so at peace with knowing that you're not going to get things done there's a certain urgency i would say stress it's more like oh, but i also want to do that oh i want to do that it's like that sort of like you you show up to a menu to a restaurant and the menu has like 50 kinds of pizzas right you're like jesus where do I start? That sounds good. That sounds good. Is it a stress? But it's definitely uh, uncomfortable. I'll say like this, this discomfort in knowing yeah. I'm more than one person and I have so much amazing internal things that I'll never release into the world. But I yeah. wish I could put them out there. Yeah. So it's just like almost like FOMO from your own life like I, I wish i could do more you know like <laughs> yeah i've started yeah. thinking i've also started so the, the counter to that for me is mm. for moon uh mm. which is fear of missing out on now uh, mm. because sometimes i'm like so thinking of like this project i want to do in the future or like this even worrying about the past but often it's like i want to do this i want to do this i want to do this and it's like I'm not doing anything right now. Like, what am I doing right now? <laughs> so, yeah. It's, uh, does it keep yeah. you awake at all? Do your ideas keep you awake? Or wake you up? When, when, I've, when I've clashed into a really good idea, I know it's really good because I'm struggling to sleep. Okay. Um, like, you go to sleep and, you know, like, um, maybe I'm even in bed with, I'm in bed with my partner. And 
I'm even struggling to be present for that date, to be present for each other. Because at the forefront, I'm talking, I'm listening, but at the back, it's like, oh, write this down, write this down, write that down. Oh, shit, I, am I being rude now? Um, so what I tend to do is, I haven't officially had the conversation, but I'll just say, oh, please, let me just write this down. Then I just put in the notes app. And yeah. then I know it's safe, so I don't have to worry about remembering it, so I can be present. Yeah. Um, so that helps in some in some ways, but again, it's still um, it's a problem when you're trying to be sociable and be around other people. Yeah, it's definitely not a a good when you're alone. It's great because then you can get upset with it. You know the consequences consequences to you and your sleep and your rest and your uh, ability to create the next day and and, and and you can bargain with yourself around that. But when you are now carrying that kind of energy and intensity into someone else's shared time, I feel a little bit dirty about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I guess I have that with my partner. It's like, she'll, she'll be like, ask me like, this, this, this. And I'll be like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just don't even realize like, or it's only afterwards. She's, she's like, so have you done that? I'm like, what? I, and I was just so like engaged in what I was like thinking about or yeah. or like I'm like looking at my screen or something and but I'm replying at the same time it's like this auto like just mm. <laughs> and I try not to do it but I'm doing it <laughs> so yeah it's, uh, you know what that's like I don't remember in Iron Man when Tony Stark would, was downstairs and he sent the robot upstairs as if it was inside the robot, but it wasn't. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, it's, it's like, or even like, I think uh, Dr. Manhattan in Watchmen did something similar. He just like replicated himself. Oh, yeah. He yeah. With his partner, and he's like on another mission somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like you say, it's just, it's kind of mean, right? Not to be there. You kind of want to mm. be there, right? So. But you have to work, right? It's not, it's not like you are actively trying to ignore them or be dissociated from the experience. You genuinely have to work to say, switch off, switch off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comes back, switch off. Switch <laughs> off. <laughs> it's this little monkey on your back that's like, hey, buddy, thoughts, thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, it's a skill you can work at and develop. Like, I try and like, when I, if I'm sharing space with someone, the moment I show up, I try to put my phone as far away from me. Um, For sure. And where I'm right now, there's a TV. It's really difficult not to switch it on. But at home, I don't have a TV. So with a different partner, um, they didn't have a device, like a, a, a device for purely watching. They, they had a laptop, right? And I found when I was in their house, easy straightforward conversations i can give full attention because the phone is in the room and they're using their phone to play music so it's plugged in uh with an aux cable there's no computer or tv we can look at so we are able to just sit with, with each other and talk yeah and it was really really beautiful and even when my mind is on fire when you that's like totally focused on being present like that it's easier to forget the fire um, mm. because you have it's especially with the creative person as well right like like right now i'm not thinking about all my other creative work because we have a nice conversation yeah. that's still stimulating my creativity yeah 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 if this is a horrible mundane boring conversation <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, then i'm gonna, gonna wander off yeah. because i've got other thoughts, other better thoughts that we have. Yeah. 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 No, the mind is crazy, man. Mm. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. It's a wild, wild field. And what, what, uh, I realize it's getting late for you, man. We must end soon, but I was wondering, what are your, what's your relationship with Zoom now? Like, how do you feel? Have you, are you like, Disconnect. I mean, you've got family in Zoom, so 
but like how do you feel about do you think you'd ever go back to living in Zoom or so I, I'm, I'm I grew up in a very complicated way uh, my idea of home is exactly where I am it's not where my people are from it's where my people are um, because I grew up in a very communal context, whether at home or at school. So I was always kind of equally close to everybody, but not close enough to feel attached to somebody. Um, so I don't feel any sort of attachment to Zimbabwe or even to my village or to my mother's house, my father's house. Like these are just places. Um, and in the same way, I don't feel attached to Cape Town. I can leave Cape Town tomorrow, you know, and go settle somewhere else. So, and I've lived here half my life, uh, just for some context. Yeah. So Zim is interesting in as much as it's another African place, right? But I can equally leave right now and go to Tanzania and have a similar experience and feel fulfilled in the same ways because um surrounded by blackness and I'm celebrating blackness and I'm enjoying blackness. So that's that's to say like there's nothing particularly drawing me to Zimbabwe. Especially because I don't see the need for that classification to say I'm a Zimbabwean and I'm a Shona person and I'm a Kore Kore person. Um the one um, the one term that I do associate with myself is I'm black. Um and that means I'm African to me, right? So ideally staying on the continent is on the cards. Um, I would want to leave the continent, I don't think. Uh, it's a permanent move. But the idea of going back to Zimbabwe, um, not particularly appealing because of a few different reasons. Number one, I haven't seen enough of Africa to justify moving back to Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to leave Cape Town so I can see the rest of the place. Uh, because I can trace a bunch of my roots through Malawi, Tanzania, and Kenya, Uganda. So I would love to see all those places, um, to see a familiar difference, but also I'd love to go to like Tunisia. Looks nothing like, sounds nothing like, like what's that like? What's, what's a black person going through, you know? Um, but also the, the challenges of living in Zimbabwe as well. Um, I have no desire for that uh, struggle. Um, yeah. Life is difficult. Life is difficult under the best of circumstances and I'm trying to avoid difficulty that I, I can avoid, yeah. And I know going back home is going to present a lot of opportunities for excitement and growth and happiness, but also going to provide a lot of opportunities for hurt and pain. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm just not interested in that, yeah. Yeah. I have a relatively easy life if we're putting it into perspective. Yeah. And I find my easy life very difficult. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's really interesting that you've you're at that kind of like point where half your life has been lived outside Zoom. Uh, yeah. I'm like rapidly approaching that. Uh, well, it's <laughs> maybe four more years, but it's like whoa. <laughs> it's mm. Interesting. Interesting. What are like 31 now? Yeah, 31, 32. So yeah. No, it's cool. Huh. Yeah, and I guess it's kind of funny. Something that a thought that popped into my head there was with you saying like going to Tanzania and sort of being in a place with black people. Uh how I don't have that with or I'm not conscious of that with white people so much. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Yeah. Or maybe I am, or maybe I've just always been surrounded with white people, like in little bubbles. Uh, and yeah, it's a weird thing for me having, like the UK is not, not a culture I necessarily identify with, but a lot of my, the way I was raised is like based on the UK's mm. culture. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 I was talking with someone about this earlier on as well. Like, I was explaining to him 
I am more white than I am black in a lot of ways, right? Like, and but I am mean Africans in general, right? Um, either you are Belgian, essentially I'm of British descent. Some people are of Belgian descent, some of Dutch descent, some of like German descent. Um, in that way of like all the things that I, I, a very normal part of what they have nothing to do with home, nothing to do with this place. Yeah. You striving and, for that piece of paper and that distinction mm, from first, yeah. first class. <laughs> <laughs> and, but even like the mundane things as simple as like, even like the, the clothing you wear um, or like, yeah, the, the idea of, you, you can leave Zim and move to England and not feel a cultural change to your life yeah. or a significant cultural change. To yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a very hectic thing yeah. to realize and to yeah. accept. Yeah. yeah. Whereas a, a black American can move to Cape Town and still feel like they're in America. You know, that's, that's like the, the other side of that, uh, duality. Yeah. They can still, access their hagen and Reese's Peanut Cups and Dunkin' Donuts and blah, 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 blah. The music, the fashion, uh, everything, right? They can come here and approximate blackness by being in a black place, but still be very comfortable and not be challenged and not be faced with new foods and, and all these other discomforts of trying to wrangle with your identity, right? Yeah. But put the same person like in Ghana, they may have a very different experience. Yeah. Mm. Or like in Sudan or wherever, right? Obviously, we're all approximations of this Eurocentric legacy of colonization. But there are some places where certainly um, you're going to feel a lot more at home than others. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And it's I mean, it's very, it's going back to the idea of vanilla <laughs> and it's <laughs> like a funny how it goes with the color also, but mm. yeah, you just don't get flavor, man. You're just the same, mm. losing out in that flavor of life. Like, <laughs> mm. It's true. It's true. I always tell people who ask me like, uh, where can I buy some of your ingredients? Like the food that you're using or the spice that you're using. And I always say, ask your immigrant friends. And you can see the ones who, are, who, who don't have immigrant friends. Yeah. Like the way they react. You can see this person has no idea of anyone who's not white in their life. Yeah. Right. Or I say, like, uh, where are Ghanaians shop? Or ask your black friends. Right. And sometimes I say to see how they react to that statement. Um, like, uh, just, just, just to provoke them a little bit. I'm saying what I need to say, but I haven't said it, actually. I've just said something else, but you, you've got the message, right? Like, uh, um, you know, sometimes people come with their family, for example, right? And it's, let's say it's a, it's a white family. And the kids are the ones who, dis who decided that they wanted ice cream. And they saw this ice cream place. And they come in, they're excited, ice cream, yay! Then they look at the menu like, oh no, you made a mistake, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you can see the parents now trying to navigate that situation. All right. Some parents do a great job because they're like, oh no, this is different, but try it. These are flavors from Africa. We are Africans. Try something different. If you don't like it, it's okay, but we're not going to leave until you've had a good taste of something. It's important you learn this lesson. Other parents, same attitude. Oh no, we don't want this. They leave as well immediately. And you can see how the kid is picking up on that oh, kind of yeah. um, close mind perspective. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And then other parents know something is wrong here, but they can't bring themselves to correct the kid or to encourage the kid to try something. But they feel guilty. So I will have some ice cream, so they buy ice cream. And you best believe I'm getting a nice tip that day. <laughs> because it's like, 
they want the money does the work that they are too ashamed to do for their child. So they will bribe me for my silence or to atone, but they still don't want to do the work of saying to their kid, or even they do work for themselves to say, oh, what kind of kid am I raising? Or rather, what kind of job am I doing at raising my kids that they feel this is okay? <laughs> because I'm very open about it. Right? If a kid says, oh, these are funny flavors, eh? I'm like, oh no, they're not funny. You just don't eat this in your house. Right? <laughs> and that's a message for the kid and a message for the parent as well. So, <laughs> fix this problem. <laughs> you know? But I say it in a very open way, very, it's not aggressive, it's not confrontational. It's just like, oh no, I grew up eating this all the time. You see how the tub is almost empty? It's because other people love this flavor. Maybe you can try, maybe you find something you like. You know, it's very yeah. provoking, but it's also very open and inviting. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's so awesome. Huh. I had a funny thing because I'm like applying for jobs. Mm. And uh, I mean, like, my whole work life pretty much have been applying for jobs outside of Zimbabwe. Uh, mm. And so there's always like visa issues. And, mm. and I just had a moment where I was like, oh, I'm an immigrant. Like, but like, mm. in my head, I'm like, no, I think of an immigrant as being like mm. maybe someone from, maybe someone with, black skin or brown mm. skin uh mm. or maybe like eastern europe but i don't mm. think of myself as an immigrant i'm like, mm. I'm like i am kind of like but even now i'm like i don't identify with that really uh yeah but, you're, you're, if you if if you had been living in england and moved to zim you would have been expat right you would have been an immigrant <laughs> that's that's the term for migratory white people is expat. Yeah. Yeah, everything goes out of, out, it's all from the center of, of the UK, like, everything goes out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's a, it's a weird, yeah, a weird thing, and, like, I don't feel like I, I probably, I do, like, I struggle to, like, open bank accounts and things like, so I'm having, like, these experiences that, like, yeah. other immigrants are having, but there's still a part of me that's, like, so ingrained in the like I'm like but i'm from here like <laughs> mm. Mm. which which in a way it, it makes sense as well right like um i can imagine it's uncomfortable and disconcerting to know that your lineage is from this place but this place doesn't acknowledge you Dude, yeah right? like you still have to do all the dancing around like but like it's, 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 it's like um, it's like someone who isn't Debele from Zim coming to South Africa and not being welcome, but their people are South African originally. They left South Africa, right? Yeah. It's a fact that is no. You yeah. know? It's, yeah, it's, 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 there's a tension there. And I, and I get it. I can, I can see why it wouldn't yeah. automatically click that you're an immigrant because it's almost like a homecoming. You're going back home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had this amazing experience when I was doing when I was starting up in Glasgow uh, mm. where someone was like dude there's a guy another guy from Zimbabwe here you gotta meet him so I go up to this dude and uh, he's a black Zimbabwean yeah. and I greet him in Shona and the dude was just like he just started speaking Shana. My Shana is terrible, but he was just, like, <laughs> so chuffed to have someone like in his school speaking to him in Shona. And it was just like, you could just see how visibly happy he was. Uh, yeah. And I was like, eventually, like, dude, slow down. My Shona is like terrible. But <laughs> then we like started talking, and he's like, he's been here since he was 12 or something. Oh, uh, wow. And like, he has a British passport. And he was like talking about how it's like difficult for him to go. To Zimbabwe because of now he's on a British passport or whatever. Because uh, I was asking when were you last there, and it was just this weird ass thing because I had struggled with getting a student visa, like messed up my application and being rejected. And mm. I was like, it's so bizarre that he's struggling to get to Zimbabwe and I'm struggling to get to this place. Uh, mm. <laughs> we're struggling to get to the places where we kind of originated from. Yeah, but in the recent history history of our lineage uh, <laughs> it's 
is just such a bizarre like wow i had a, I had a similar feeling or a similar world kind of universal feeling um when I got my permanent residence in South Africa, I remember feeling very conflicted about it. Like, it's like an official accepting that for all the different reasons, we all can't easily go back home. It was like, it was like an official, like, yeah, you, you don't have a, like um how do i put this nicely the safety of going home is not guaranteed you have, have yet to go to such a length to avoid going home and how sad is that right like yeah it's one thing to say i want to leave zip because i want to go explore the world i wish i do but if the understanding is you can't go back for whatever reason i mean you can go back anytime you want practically speaking, what does that look like? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a very like, I was glad to finally have my papers, but also like very sad that how many more people are making this decision every month, every year, every, you know, like yeah. out of necessity, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole border system and visa system is yeah. can of worms, yeah. That's wild. Listen, man, I need to get going soon. Yeah, sorry, uh, Tef. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is be, be good, man. Thank you. Thanks so much. We'll have to do it again sometime. No worries, have some more to say. <laughs> no worries, boys, hey, Lee, don't get me started, bro. I always got shit to say. Yeah. No, it's Thank really, you very much, man. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Cool, cool, cool. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully yeah. I'll come back to, to the mother city at some stage. Miss that place. For sure. Gotta taste, gotta taste that ice cream. Hey, the promise of this. <laughs> Amazing. Cool tap. See you, man. Yeah, bro. Have a good yeah. one.